Uh, the geopolitical landscape is something that our speakers on stage already today have touched on and been at pains to talk about as a factor that's fundamentally shifting the way that we might have viewed the energy transition, this conversation, uh, just uh, to pace, time, structure, you name it, risk uh, over the course of the last five, ten years. So I'm looking forward to discussing this. We could not have a better expert to guide us through this conversation and talk to us about what's going on in the world at the moment and how we should be thinking about it. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage Bruno McKays, who's a Portuguese politician, consultant, and award-winning author. He is a senior advisor to numerous companies, a former Secretary of State for European Affairs in Portugal, and a columnist for the New Statesman. Can you join with me in making Bruno feel very welcome? Welcome, welcome. Hi there. You've How done well. You? You've tied in a little bit of purple. Got a, a little pop bit of color because I saw this morning. No, I, I love I, it. I had it's to brilliant. Fit. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Hello, everyone. I feel like more than anyone I know, Bruno seems to hop countries by the day, let alone by the week. So you've got an incredible sense of the pulse of what's going on at this moment in time. I thought we might start um, before we get into your take on the here and now, just with a definitional piece. We're hearing a lot of conversation at the moment around the energy crisis. Can you talk to us about what we mean by that? What does that term encompass? Well, the way I see it, we are realizing that, in fact, the world of energy abundance that we thought we lived in was not a world of energy abundance. In Europe, it's already very clear that we live in a world of energy scarcity. It's an interesting question where we got the idea that we lived in, in a world of energy abundance. Prices were low. Uh, people were not concerned with access to energy, in large part because there's a whole apparatus of policy, of subsidies, of, of price controls that, that keeps prices down. But that, in a way, just uh, instigated the crisis that happened, was triggered in part by the war in Ukraine, but not only. Mm -hmm. Already in 2021, Europe was suffering from um, difficulty of access, or rising prices, and so on. There are different factors that explain it. But essentially, it's a change of mindset, it's a change of paradigm, uh, and it's a call to, to do something about it because it's going to continue. So we put a political lens over energy crisis. Can you talk to us a little bit about what it means at a high level for the geopolitical order of the world? When we throw, find ourselves in the situation Europe's in at the moment, what, what does that ripple through and create as a tension and a, a reality across politics? Mm -hmm. Let me give you the maximalist reading of what is happening, which, by the way, is Vladimir Putin's reading. But not only. There's a research analyst at Credit Suisse that's become very popular in the last few weeks, uh, Zoltan Posar, that uh, defends similar ideas. Uh, but what, what Putin said in the St. Petersburg Economic Forum about two or three months ago was that financial order led by the United States is being replaced by a commodity energy order where Russia will have a, a dominant role. Essentially, we had delegated our economic policy to central banks. Central banks could manage prices, and they could also manage the price of energy. Are we changing to a world where that can no longer be done? Central banks cannot print oil, they cannot print natural gas. Uh, in Europe, we're seeing very clearly that the European Central Bank is not able to bring those energy prices down. It's a geopolitical question. It's a question of power. It's a question of the use of energy for geopolitical goals. Russia and Putin seem to believe that by controlling access to energy, you're in a position where essentially you can dictate terms to other countries. Mm. The position the Kremlin would tell you that the United States has benefited for decades of, for example, being able to deny access to currency swaps and trigger a financial crisis in countries that are not friendly. And if we change to that new kind of paradigm where energy becomes central and replaces finance at the center of our economies, mm. then obviously everything would be different. That is the sort of maximalist reading of what a geopolitics of energy could be. But between that and the relevance of energy for geopolitics, there are, of course, many uh, other possible uh, equilibrium. Lots to unpack in that. To begin with, uh, Putin situation in the Ukraine right now. What's your take on what's going to play out there? A long war, uh, perhaps a frozen conflict of some sort, uh, where the intensity of the conflict diminishes, but certainly no resolution in view. The news today, if, you, if you've seen that, and if you keep track of the news on Ukraine, 
is that Russia may actually be moving towards a more intense form of conflict with a partial mobilization, which they haven't accepted yet, uh, and also a referenda in some of the occupied territories. A matter of grave concern to Ukraine, but also to Western democracies, because one understanding of what uh, Russia is trying to do is by incorporating those territories into Russia proper, mm. you bring them under the nuclear umbrella. And a conflict to recover or regain control over Donetsk or Lugansk could raise the nuclear issue, because that would be Russian territory. So we're still at the beginning, and in many respects, things could get worse from now on. I want to ask you too about you know, what this means, Europe's dependency on Russian energy sources and things like that. I've heard both sides of the argument. I've heard some people say this is going to catalyze greater investment, doubling down, you know, needing to support you know, greater homegrown sources of energy in order to diminish reliance on Russian hydrocarbons. Others make the argument this is going to lead to a regression uh, in the way that we might be approaching the energy transition. What's your take on what it means for that fork in the road, perhaps? Right now, it seems to me in a, a real serious effort at diversification. The solution seems to be access to LNG. There's a question of prices and costs. Now, it's possible that LNG prices will come down as um, producers realize that there's a lot of money to be made here. And of course, there's still reserves that are not being explored in all kinds of places around the world. Mm -hmm. That could happen, perhaps not this year, but over the, the coming few years. That's what Europe is trying to do. Uh, serious negotiations with Qatar, serious negotiations with uh, uh, Brazil, African countries, uh, Canada, if we can get over the problems with infrastructure, lack of infrastructure to, to bring LNG to Europe. But that seems to be the solution for the time being. Uh, there isn't really any significant acceleration of the transition. Uh, and there isn't a serious discussion of uh, going back to nuclear in Germany, not yet. I want to ask you about something you wrote about in your newspaper column this week. You said across Europe, the underlying problem of energy scarcity remains unaddressed. Can you expand a bit on that? Yes. Uh, well, we have uh, a lot of pressure on energy supplies that come essentially from three directions. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Russia, and a kind of de disaggregation of the uh, world order led by the United States. If you think about it, some of the largest main producers of energy are now outcasts in the international order. Venezuela, Iran, and now Russia. You can see this as a sign of decline of American power all over the world because one obvious sign of American power was the ability to secure uh, and in, in some cases build these energy networks that span the whole globe. So that's one source of stress. The second source of stress is, of course, the climate crisis, mm. uh, the sense that we cannot rely on the traditional energy sources and, and we have to find others. And the third source of stress um, is the fact that, for the time being, it's very difficult to believe that renewables can be the whole solution. Mm. These three fact the, the technological limits on renewables are still significant. These three factors together are enough to create an environment of energy scarcity in Europe. You're not feeling it yet in the United States or Canada, and perhaps you'll never will, not in China, but Europe was always the weakest link in global energy networks, mm. not self-sufficient and not having a military uh, ready to secure energy lines uh, all across the globe. Yep. I want to ask you about another phrase you wrote about recently. From here, two paths seem possible, economic and social stagnation or an energy revolution. Can you paint a picture of both those paths and uh, I guess what would be the leading indicators that we're heading down one or the other? Right, so I'm quite concerned that in fact we will be heading towards um, economic, social stagnation or regression in Europe. And the form that could take is a process of deindustrialization. So already serious concern, companies I talked to, that perhaps uh, the aluminium sector in Europe has, has, is no longer viable with the current energy prices. Steel sector, no longer viable. Fertilizer sector, perhaps no longer viable. Then you get all these feedback loops, because from stress in the fertilizer industry, you get higher food costs. Eventually, this would translate into social unrest, social conflict. That's a perfectly plausible path for Europe. Then the other path, um, which in many respects is still difficult to see, is a path where we would embrace a genuine uh, energy revolution. That would not be about limiting emissions. It would be about moving towards a better and higher source of energy. Um, 
but it's still unclear what that can be. But clear, we, we're at a moment where continuity and routine no longer work, and we either go back or we go forward. You were telling me that you've been polling people since you've been here about uh, what, it, what it will take to see an energy revolution. What have you, what have you garnered from our audience? Yes, I, I keep asking everyone I meet, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to ask some of you. Uh, we're at the, at the edge of science fiction something that is not possible today, but we're confident that will become possible within 10, 20 years. I'm very interested in that kind of discussion. What are the energy changes, revolutions that, that we can envisage? Now, I think people are skeptical about hydrogen. Uh, I think people are skeptical about nuclear fusion. Uh, I hear a lot about uh, revolutionary breakthroughs in, in carbon capture of different kinds, perhaps at source, uh, just had a fascinating conversation about uh, how the fertilizing industry can actually have a form of carbon capture in the soil. I think that's probably where, where we can expect some more dramatic change. And that we mean that in a way we could, we could keep going the way we have been going uh, while reducing emissions, but not giving up on what is clearly still the superior form of energy, uh, uh, hydrofuels. We had a whole conversation on stage this morning about ESG and the role of the market, the role of companies. What's your take on capitalism at, at large? Right, so I'm, I'm skeptical, and I know there are different views are, uh, about this here. I'm skeptical that the market by itself and market incentives by, by themselves can bring about the kind of energy revolution that I'm talking about here. Energy revolution comparable to the energy revolution from 1870 to 1914 where suddenly the shape of our societies and of our economies is turned upside down for the better. And lots of things become possible that people had never dreamed about. Now, is the market sufficient to bring that about? I don't think so. I mean, as a political philosopher uh, writing a lot about history, I'm convinced that these revolutions come about as the outcome of historical forces. As societies enter periods of crisis, and they look for ways to overcome fundamental crises, they embrace change at this level. But the market, by its, the market can play a role, but by itself, the market is, has not been designed to embrace change of this kind. I know you're a very passionate historian. Is there anything we can learn from that last period of energy revolution you referenced that could carry forward and provide wisdom for the current day? Yes, yeah, so a bold ambition, a sense that you are in a dangerous moment where lots of things could unravel and that you have to embrace the future. You know, thinking about what happened in the United States around 1870, um, what justifies that moment of radical change? And I think it was the sense that American democracy at such a large continental scale with lots of social conflict that was starting to bubble up could not survive if you didn't have a fundamental economic breakthrough that would grant new opportunities to everyone, and not just to, to, the, to, the, to the upper class. So there was that sense of everything can unravel if we don't move forward that was present at that time, and that we have to somehow try to recover. So a sense of urgency almost. A sense of urgency, a sense of w that we are at, at sort of a, a, a moment in history where lots of things are being decided. Yep. And you've also talked about, you know, observationally, that it felt like the world, and maybe go back to Kyoto and things like that, was aligning a little bit to a degree, maybe the Western world at least, uh, around climate. And it feels like maybe with some of the energy security issues, it, it's putting a whole other lens on the conversation at the moment, isn't it? Do you worry about a splintering, perhaps, in the pursuit of uh, climate change goals, energy transition? But, you know, I was, I was never very enthusiastic about the United Nations model to fight climate change and I don't see a lot of results. I was thinking, having lunch there and listening still to some of the, of the previous panels, it seems so far, let's see the rest of the conference, when people talk about Paris, it is with a little bit of derision. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more. It wasn't the case five or ten years ago. And uh, people are skeptical about what has been achieved in that process. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, over the past ten years, a lot has changed, and geopolitics has taken over. You see suddenly China doing a lot, uh, and it's doing a lot because there's this awareness that whoever leads this climate transition is going to rule the world, to put it simply. Mm. Now, think back, I already talked about the United States, 1870 to 1910. Something happened there that was also the foundation for American power over the 20th century. And if you think back to the first Industrial Revolution, control over coal production and the steam engine was the 
bedrock of British power over the 17th, 18th century. And there's a sense in China that something similar could happen now. Mm. And that uh, these new energy technologies that are being developed, whoever controls them will be in a privileged position. Now, is this a bad or a good thing? And I tend to think that it might be a good thing that this element of geopolitical competition might force states to do more than they would do within a framework of pure cooperation. Because we didn't see a lot uh, in the, within that framework. So to double click then, and, and it was referenced earlier by one of our panels sort of talking about how the next COP conference may end up being a real disappointment. What role, if any, do you see, you know, whether it's UN related or just multinational configurations and approaches? Because we have touched on this morning, this is a global challenge. It needs some degree of coordinated uh, urgency at least, effort, commandeering of others perhaps who are less willing to come on the journey. What role do you see multinational dialogue, bilateral playing in this? Yeah, I mean, perhaps not, not to solve the problem. Um, there are no tools or instruments at the global level to, to take decisive action. It has to be taken in the capitals and in the main capitals of the five, six mm. leading countries in terms of global power, but also in terms of emissions. But I think there's a role for global institutions, perhaps even new global institutions, in trying to reduce conflict, um, in trying to reduce the most destructive forms of conflict, trying to reduce this, um, um, the supply chain crises that are happening everywhere, uh, the sense that uh, these are no longer reliable, they're no longer stable, and perhaps the WTO should focus more on sort of preventive approach mm -hmm. rather than having fundamental breakthroughs in world trade to try to prevent some of the crises that are brewing right now when it comes to supply chains of semiconductors, for example, mm -hmm. but also of raw materials for the energy transition and minerals. I want to play back to you something else you've said, which I thought was a really interesting frame. You said, considered in isolation, reserves in oil and natural gas could last for a few more centuries, but that is the wrong way to look at the problem. What we have been consuming is not gas or oil, but degrees of warming from the burning of fossil fuels. And when you consume all the degrees you can afford, the energy supply is over. Can you speak a little bit more to that reframe? Right, I think it's, it's better to think about the, the climate crisis in, in those terms. Uh, there's a lot of oil and gas around, but there's not a lot of margin for um, a further increase in, in temperatures compared to pre-industrial temperatures. I suppose that's a way of thinking more rooted in the natural sciences and processes of entropy and less rooted in an economic approach. Economic approach is very limiting. You, only, uh, you, you have a sense of production and consumption but you don't uh, expand your view towards the uh, side effects, uh, towards the full process, the full natural process. You just focus on the immediate process of production and consumption. I think part of the reconfiguration that uh, we're being forced to do is to think less in economic terms and more in terms of natural science, uh, laws of thermodynamics, uh, those are important when we're talking about energy and we're talking about climate. I joked when we started that you seem to travel more prolifically than most humans I know. Uh, and so it does give you an, a unique uh, sense of the pulse of what the conversation is amongst leaders, amongst uh, people uh, just walking the street every day in, in countries all over the world. How have you noticed the conversation around what's rippling through Europe at the moment ripple out through the rest of the world? What are you observing beyond the boundaries of Europe? Just intense geopolitical competition. Uh, everyone uh, trying to get ahead. Everyone trying to secure uh, access to energy. We're seeing, obviously, that uh, India and China have stepped in, and Russia has still been able to sell energy at higher prices. Um, we've seen how there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of bad blood in places like Pakistan about what Europe is doing in the LNG markets. It's capturing all this LNG. and it's no longer getting uh, to, to Pakistan and other countries in South Asia. I think we should be getting ready for serious financial slash energy crisis in many parts of the world, particularly in South Asia and some African countries. I hope that we start to see some of these crises as energy crises and not just financial. I do agree with people who are trying to move us a little bit away from the financial framework into a, an energy framework, uh, but clearly, what I get out of all, this, all of this traveling is this is not routine. This is not normal times anymore. Uh, we are actually already inside what you could call uh, an energy war. Can I ask you to unpick a little bit more? You mentioned the significance of moving from a financial framework to an energy framework. Can you expand a little bit on why that's so important in your view? Uh, I think the financial framework has um, 
created a lot of complacency about, about our uh, energy problems. Uh, I also wonder sometimes, are we about to enter an age of energy scarcity, or are we already in an age of energy scarcity? If we don't look at the share of, of costs, uh, where energy is perhaps 2-3%, uh, but I think that's deceiving, and that has a lot to do with the financial framework that we use. People discuss, you've seen this discussion by Peter Thiel, by Tyler Cohen, what happened around 1975 that we started to be fundamentally unable to get high growth rates in Western countries. And the question I would ask is, isn't this already about energy? Isn't this about a sort of stalling of, of our energy progress? We're still fundamentally operating with the framework of the late 19th century. We haven't moved beyond that. Is it surprising that our economy started to slow down and we seem unable to squeeze any significant growth out of them anymore? So going back to energy may be the way to get out of, of this sense of, of stagnation, of a, a great stagnation that was already here much before the Ukraine war. I asked you at the top for your definition of energy crisis. I'd love to ask the same about energy transition, because it's a term that we hear uh, thrown around a lot. How do you define it and conceptualize it? Right, we use all kinds of, of metaphors. Um, Peter's talk this morning, I think, made some interesting comparisons to technological transitions. Um, raised a kind of concern in my mind, because he was talking about the transition from the typewriter to the laptop or even to the iPad. Um, and then later, uh, in another talk he gave upstairs, he was saying, we didn't tax the typewriter. We didn't have to tax the typewriter. Mm. But interestingly, what that means to me is that we didn't have to tax the typewriter in order to move to the computer because there was a sense of ambition and confidence that within the digital realm, we can have fundamental transformations. But we don't have that sense of confidence within the realm of atoms, within the realm of energy. So sometimes I think when we're talking about an energy transition, we're talking about something that is coercive, mm. and that many people, though they want to spell it out, think it will be for the worse, that we'll be living in a world of energy scarcity and no longer in a world of energy abundance. Uh, so that's certainly one way to read it. I, I see energy transition as a fundamental regime change, as everything about our societies and our economies have to change. And you're not going to be able to, to reach the energy transition that we aim for if we don't bear that in mind, uh, that um, it's, it's, it's a, a change similar to what happened at the end of the 19th century. It's We've talked a lot about Europe in this conversation. We haven't talked about China, and I can tell our audience, certainly in the conversations that are coming over the next couple of days, particularly as we delve into batteries tomorrow, that's going to become front and centre. But you have written a book on the Belt and Road Initiative, looking particularly at the question of how will this audacious initiative shape the world over the next 40, 50 years. Can you speak a little bit to that in the context of energy and just what it, it potentially has to play out in terms of geopolitics and the energy transition? Yes. So, you know, we have three main industrial powerhouses in the world, the United States, the European Union, and, and China. Uh, I already talked about Europe and how I think we're not acting as an industrial powerhouse. An industrial powerhouse has to act in the world globally to secure access to energy. The United States is doing that in all kinds of ways, but also uh, among the three is the one that, that is self-sufficient. China is doing a lot of it everywhere, uh, in all kinds of geographies and in all sectors. It may now have the added advantage of perhaps within five or 10 years having privileged access to Russia's reserves. With Russia completely isolated from the West, it's possible that Russia will become the supplier uh, of energy to, to China, and perhaps at prices that are going to be low and lower than Russia hopes they will be. Putin, about a week ago, made a public comment that was slightly bizarre about how China was enforcing very low prices. So I think he um, uh, sort of um, unexpectedly confessed the problem that he's in now, that he no longer has two uh, customers to choose from and to play against each other. Uh, and then we see China being active in the Middle East more and more. We see China being active in Central Asia. Uh, we see a lot of the Belt and Road Initiative being about avoiding energy dependence. Um, they will not become dependent on Russia, I can assure you of that. Their whole effort is about uh, energy independence and energy security. And not only when it comes to um, fossil fuels, but as you alluded to also in, in the new forms of energy, 
There's a debate right now in Europe of whether we might not be exchanging our dependence on Russian fossil fuels for dependence on uh, Chinese green energy with batteries, access to lithium reserves uh, in Africa. So that's clearly something to be concerned about and try not to repeat the same mistakes. Mm, you'd hope we'd learn, absolutely. I'm going to put a temporary pause in this conversation for two reasons. One, because I'm going to invite you again to jump on Slido and submit your questions, uh, because we would love to have you get involved in this conversation, ask the questions about energy security, geopolitical risk that you would love to hear Bruno answer. But secondly, because I'd also love to introduce uh, our second panelist who's going to join us for this extended part of the conversation, and that's Martha Hall Finley, who's the Chief Climate Officer at Suncor, uh, who looks at how they address the nexus between climate and energy at Suncor. She was also instrumental in the development of, and plays a critical leadership role in, the multi-company oil sands pathways to net zero by 2050 initiative. Can you please welcome Martha to the stage? Come on in. Hi there. Thank you for being here. Good to see you. Martha, you've just heard all of what Bruno's talked about there. That's uh, a lot to digest about the state of geopolitics. I might start first by just grounding us in where we are. What's your Canadian take on that whole global geopolitical puzzle? Ooh, the Canadian take. Um, <clears throat> uh, f the first word that comes to mind is frustration. Mm -hmm because we have a long history of having allies in Europe being allies with European countries, and we are not able to help. Um, we actually have been able to help Ukraine in, in, you know, for some time even before the invasion, in terms of training and, and equipment, but helping European countries with their energy needs, we can't right now. In fact, we had members of the Canadian government come and say, what can you do? What you in the energy industry in, in, in Canada, what can you do? How much more can you produce? And our answer is, well, one, we, we, we can't get it out of the country because of past decisions. And because of those past decisions, even if we were to have instant access to uh, transport out of the country, we don't have the production ca capacity because we haven't been able to build that up because we haven't had market egress. Um, I will say that um, the opportunity for Canada remains to be able to help. Mm. Um, you and I had a brief conversation earlier about, well, you know, uh, LNG, you know, the, 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 our, our Prime Minister said, well, there's no business case. Well, of course, Australia just signed a 40-year deal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but I think that the situation will not... The energy security concerns are going to remain for many, many years now. There's a level of trust that, will have, that, that has been destroyed. Mm. Um, and so I think uh, there are opportunities for Canada, but we're going to have to look at them and take them now and build that capacity. And I also wanted to ask you from your corporate perspective, one of the things we heard uh, Gillian talk about this morning and in the ESG panel was sort of what's included in the economic model and what's not. And one of the things they referenced that we hadn't necessarily built all that well into the model was things like geopolitical risk, climate change, et cetera. Um, How's that factoring at a corporate level? How are you thinking about geopolitical risk as a company now and contending with that? Because it feels like it's looming on the strategic horizon to a much greater degree than we were thinking about this even 12 months ago, let alone five, 10 years ago. Well, some companies that have operations in many parts of the world obviously think of this of in, in different ways. Um, so there are those aspects of it. But then for, for me, I think there's the longer term, what does this mean in terms of energy security? And what are the implications for political um, security? Because um, I mean, listening to you talk and the really, really thoughtful commentary on, on the intertwining of those two things. Um, I think that uh, I, at, at a conference a, a few months ago, I actually found myself saying, well, we need a, it was just after the invasion, and, and, a, and I said, we need a NATO, an energy NATO. Um, of course, not North Atlantic, because the energy producing countries are not necessarily North Atlantic, to your point, Europe in particular uh, suffers from that, from not being able to. But I do think that there needs to be some real thinking around how do we get like-minded countries both energy producers and energy consumers to really work on, okay, we got caught. This is a problem, and this winter is going to be a real problem. Canada got caught. We don't have the infrastructure to help. Mm. How do we 
how do we work on improving that, both from a Canadian perspective, but also, frankly, a global one? Um, I do think, for example, there's a real opportunity for North American collaboration in this regard, um, because we're a continent. But I do think there's a real opportunity for more global co collaboration on an energy security um, level, not just a trade, for example. I'm going to come to you both on this um, question. It's the top voted question from our audience at the moment. Martha, I might come to you first, because for those who don't know, Martha's here in part uh, because of her wonderful corporate role, but also you've got an incredible history of service in Canadian public sector <laughs> and in the nonprofit landscape as well. Question from our audience around, with the energy transition as you described it, do you think that societies will expect a lower standard of living in the future? So it gets a little bit to something we touched on this morning but didn't really delve into, this whole piece around energy poverty and this inextricable link at the moment between sort of uh, the inability to keep the lights on and your political outcome and just the way that that's playing out in some countries. So I'd, I love your thoughts on what you think it means for the future of sort of standard of living. Well, I, 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 this has been a problem for decades. Ever. It's been a problem for centuries. Mm. Um, energy poverty, poverty and lack of energy are totally intertwined. Yeah as is the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Prosperity, economic prosperity, and I would argue to, to a great extent social prosperity, are inextricably entwined with um, access to affordable, easily used energy. There's a reason why oil and gas are ubiquitous. For many, many, many years, they have been easily accessed, easily used, pretty cheap. Um, so, so I don't think it's a new question. Mm -hmm. I think geopolitics have rendered it a little more pressing, I think, in sure. some places. But then we also have food security is totally related to the same, to the same challenges. Um, I, what I think we have to also remember is tied to that is what are we doing about climate? Mm. Be because again, talk about inextricably entwined, that is too. And I, and, I, and I really think it's important to stress, people ask us all the time, oh wow, um, it, are all of your efforts, your pathways, oil sands pathways to net zero alliance, is that, is that, is that now put on hold mm -hmm. because of energy security? And, and our answer is absolutely not. I can tell you that at every, every hours every week of, of trying to work out how do we actually get this done, mm -hmm. it is never, not once, not one iota of conversation has been, um, well, maybe we need to put that aside. It has always been, how do we do both? Um, and I do think we have to do both. And in doing both, we have to also include the energy security for, uh, for um, uh, developing nations. I mean, after all, that's by far the majority of the world population. Absolutely. Um, Bruno, I want to come to you on energy poverty in a moment, but I just want to double click on the pathways piece because you heard Bruno talk about his views on multilateral government dialogues earlier. You've had an, another side of the political coin, which is the multi-business co collaboration. <laughs> Uh, how has the, the politics of navigating that been in the sense of getting alignment uh, and, and a, a sense of unity on the direction and, and really putting some robust uh, frameworks behind what it is that that collective wants to achieve? Can you talk us through that side of the politics, the corporate politics, perhaps? So, so how, is, how easy is it to actually get anything done with six really hard competing companies? It's basically my subtext, at, yeah. At, at, the, at the same <laughs> table? Um, uh, it's been incredible, and a lot of people in the room would know that COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands in, in, uh, Innovation Alliance, um, was started 10 years ago. Ironically, a nice 10 year, 10 year anniversary. So the pathways to, uh, Oil Sands Pathways to Net Zero Alliance, we decided uh, almost two years ago now, officially it was launched a little over a year ago, um, that although COSIA was doing really good work on a number of environmental things, the really big elephant in the room, emissions reduction, no, wasn't working. There were too many concerns about sharing intellectual property. There were too many concerns about competition, right? Mm -hmm. Until we realized, okay, this is existential to the industry. We cannot put our individual competing interests in front of what we collectively need to do as an industry. That was fundamental to realizing, to, to getting a step change in collaboration. What's really interesting is that we get asked now quite often, can you talk not just about how you collaborated with industry, but how did you get a federal government that a few years ago kind of wasn't your friend? Um, we have in Canada had a federal government that has not been terribly supportive of this industry. With, with whom we are collaborating very heavily now. 
Um, there's a lot more to go, there are bumps in the road, but that in and of itself is a how. It is, it is a, a, a level of collaboration of, of, of pretty unusual bedfellows, frankly. And, uh, and so it's not just the six companies, it is the federal government, it is the Alberta government. It is, and, and more and more we're seeing, you know, civil society, people in civil society saying, oh, this is really interesting. How are you, you know, can we get involved? How, how does this happen? How, you know, it's, it's been, there's so much more to do, so I don't want to say it's been fantastic, because it is being fantastic. But it's, uh, it's a little work, but um, we're very proud of it. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we'll have more questions about that. But Bruno, I want to come to you on energy poverty, and I also want to ask you the top voted question at the moment. Talking about in the new world order of global energy scarcity, why wouldn't we see more countries embracing nuclear? So maybe first on energy policy, if you're a part of poverty, if you want to add anything on that, and then let's, let's head in the nuclear direction. Well, nuclear is a good question, and it's been discussed in Europe, but not enough. Uh, still a lot of taboos. Uh, obviously fits with this society of anxiety, um, society that always worries about the worst case scenario. And if you get into that mindset, uh, then nuclear becomes more difficult to embrace. I think things will change as we enter this period of social, economic unrest and, and stagnation that I think is coming. But there's also another reason that, has, that is less related to uh, anxiety about nuclear. It has to do with the costs. Mm -hmm. That is extremely expensive and it's a long process with the technology we're using now, but also the regulatory framework. And governments sometimes are not willing to embrace a, a project that will be criticized and it will only be ready online within 20 years when they won't reap any profits from that. So perhaps the move, and we were talking a little bit about this uh, earlier, perhaps the move towards uh, these mini nuclear reactors. Um, I mean, in an ideal future, every medium-sized town would have its own mini nuclear reactor, and we would think about building cities in this way. By the way, China is doing that, mm -hmm. yeah. and they have an incredibly ambitious large-scale project of um, building about 60, 70 nuclear reactors over the next 25 years. Uh, so I think it will be done, and perhaps a little bit of uh, imitation of what China is doing, a little bit of need and necessity and urgency mm. will get us there, but not yet. Martha, anything to add on the nuclear conversation? Um, yes, uh, because I happen to be quite involved in looking at that as, a, as an option for the oil sands, for Suncor, as well as for the oil sands. Um, there's no question there's a view small modular can address some of the long-term concerns and the big costs, mm. right? The, the hope is that um, with economies of scale, you're able to actually manage the whole modular aspect. Um, there are still taboos. There, there is, frustratingly, because I think there are an awful lot of m misconceptions, frankly, about, about nuclear, but as a Canadian, we have a fantastic history in Canada. Um, with nuclear. We have a fantastic reputation globally with respect to uh, knowledge, our safety record, um, our regulatory approach. Um, so that does give us a bit of, of a, as an opportunity. So I, I wear my oil sand, my Suncor hat, my oil sands hat and say, we're very interested. It has to make sense. It has to be commercially and technically viable, right? That's, we're in business, kind of have to do that. Um, but as a Canadian, I, I put on my Canada hat and say, but this could be really interesting. We have, it's not just small towns, we have a lot of very remote communities mm -hmm. where transmission, it just is not possible. Transmission's hard at the best of times given not my backyard concerns, mm -hmm. but for remote communities in particular, uh, there is hope that small modular might be a really interesting answer. Now, Bruno, I'd love to tease out, uh, you, you just make me think it when you talked about regional and remote, um, just the, the difference in this conversation, and uh, you've touched on some of the big players in an emerging or medium uh, kind of economic development stage sense, but how do you see these conversations around the geopolitics of energy, energy security, energy sovereignty, some of these terms we're seeing used a lot more frequently now, how are they playing out in emerging economies and countries? You know, what's, what's, can you give a flavour for the conversations they're having and the way they're looking at this? Well, there's, a, there's enormous concern that the path towards economic development is, is, is now pretty much closed for many of these countries, and energy is a big part of that. Uh, and if we don't solve that issue, then uh, we're going to have serious problems in the future. Uh, I'm going to Pakistan in three weeks, and uh, the discussions I'm, I'm having already, some of the meetings I'm organizing, they're all about energy and how this can be solved. Uh, 
enormous uh, suspicion, hostility towards uh, what uh, the Western world is doing, a sense that energy is being hoarded by, by the big players uh, and that there's no opportunity left for the developing world. Uh, obviously, if this becomes the dominant mood, they create enormous opportunities for China to expand its influence, which it's already doing, uh, and working with some of these countries on, on nuclear, on renewables, but also, of course, on fossil fuels, because you know, the Chinese approach is to do everything at the same time and not, not, not to pick one, one, uh, one priority among the many possible pathways. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got another question, Martha, I might come to you on it. How might governments and corporations be moved to start thinking about the natural world and thermodynamics rather than just economics? So thinking about the, the, the move beyond economics, um, we talked a bit about it on the ESG panel this morning in terms of yes. the right incentive structures and approach. What's your take on that? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm extremely proud to be part of a company that's, that's frankly lived ESG, <laughs> but under whatever different names for, for decades. Um, whether it's been engaging with, in economic reconciliation under different words with indigenous communities for decades, whether it's been working on biodiversity for decades, whether it's been, you know, Suncor, we supported a carbon price for 20 years. Like, a lot of this has been happening. A lot of this has been, you know, working on, on water recycling, for example. So, so, and, you know, the caribou up north. The herd just had a whole bunch of babies this spring. Like, that's really, to me, um, uh, well, frankly, I wouldn't have joined the company if it didn't already have that kind of reputation. Um, and so, uh, you know, we just don't talk about it very much. So I take the opportunity to, to brag a little bit. Um, I found really interesting that there was one of the comments in the ESG panel, I think it was Jillian, said, but if you, if, if you, even if you were only looking out for shareholders now, so a la Friedman, if you were only looking out for shareholders, you have to actually be taking into consideration climate, environment, social activity, inclusion and diversity. Um, you, you actually need to do all of those things. If you are a consumer facing company, you need to do those because otherwise you're going to lose customers, right? If you're not actually doing that. We're not going to attract um, the talent that we want at Suncor if we're not seen as being very much engaged in all of those things. So I would, I would argue Milton Friedman would have written the, 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 the essay maybe slightly differently now because you can't actually achieve full shareholder value if you're not actually um, uh, insisting on a larger stakeholder, uh, a larger set of stakeholder value propositions or, or efforts. Bruno, when uh, Martha came out, I asked her for her take on the Canadian piece relative to the global puzzle. We've now been asked back for your, your views on the Canadian approach. The particular wording is, do you see any potentially fatal flaws in how Canada is approaching the energy transition? It's a very loaded question. <laughs> Navigate that how right. you might like. Oh, should I give right. you some? Yeah, no, I feel like we're both. I mean, and I should, I should start by noting that I don't know enough about uh, what Canada is doing. But the thing that comes to mind immediately, and maybe that's what uh, the person asking the question wants me to, to, to say is, I think Canada should, play, should be playing a larger global role. I'm, I'm always puzzled by this reluctance. Uh, there seems to be issues in working with the US on energy, uh, and there seems to be issues with working with Europe on energy, and I don't quite understand that. Uh, Canada should be a global energy superpower, uh, and should have an open mind about the different pathways, and many different pathways are possible. When it comes to Europe, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that this infrastructure has not been built. Uh, I wrote a piece in, in 2013 saying that the future was about a Canada-Europe energy union. Europe has been looking for an energy partner for decades. First, still within the history of of colonialism, we thought the Middle East and Africa were going to be our energy partners. Didn't end very well, that story. Then for 50, 60 years was Russia. I think everyone could see coming that this would end up uh, in a geopolitical confrontation mm -hmm. because our worldviews and our interests are not aligned. Uh, and obviously, North America, the US and Canada would be, would be the privileged energy partner. Uh, difficult discussions with the US always, and I would expect them to be easier with Canada, but somehow they have not been, and you, you talked a little bit about this. Uh, hoping that can change uh, in, in the next few years. This visit by the German Chancellor was entirely focused on energy, and that's, that's good. Uh, I think this is the, the sort of changes that we're starting to see, that debates are now 
moving and they are being much more concentrated on energy and perhaps things are going to start to change. So this new uh, LNG terminal that you told me about, uh, uh, perhaps with, within two years we'll have it working. And I can tell you from discussions I've had in Brussels and Berlin that uh, really European sea LNG is a big part of our energy future for the next 20, 25 years. So there should be no reluctance in Canada to invest in that. A lot of money to be made, no? Mm. We've got a couple of questions on L uh, LNG, so we might jump in there. I might fuse the two together. So our first question is, can you provide your view on the business case for LNG development for Canada and how this can factor into global energy security? And then the second question is, after watching how Canada has failed to move on LNG infrastructure fast enough due to political factors, do we see hydrogen running in the same wall? So first up, business case for LNG, and secondly, lessons learned from LNG to date. Maybe, Martha, your best place to have first crack on that one. Um, so to be clear, uh, Suncor does not produce natural gas. So my commentary now is just purely just putting on my, my Canada hat. Um, we, up until f about five years ago, we had almost 20 LNG projects in, on the proposal books. We only have one proceeding, that's the LNG Canada that is going to be, um, I thought 2024, but, but I think maybe now 2025, but it's on the west coast. Um, the people who really need LNG right now are the Europeans, mm. wrong coast. Mm. Um, I, I was telling Bruno about, again, wearing my Canada hat, um, the, uh, the big Saguenay LNG project that was proposed would have been, to date, the world's cleanest, uh, you know, incredibly environmentally um, strong, and, and with access to Europe. But that died. Uh, it died on, on, on the proposal books. Um, my personal hope is that after the Quebec election, which happens very soon, we'll have a majority government there that may in fact actually see the opportunity there. Um, this is where it's, when, when you said my re reaction and my first word was frustration. Mm. I mean, my gosh, we have so much natural gas here. We have, Canada is top of the charts on all of the ESG metrics, except for, as you all know in this room, emissions. And we're addressing those emissions, whether it's oil or gas, we, we are addressing those emissions. We get those emissions down to a net zero level. Um, we, we should absolutely be the globally preferred supplier of this stuff, right? Because the world is going to continue to need it for a long time. You know, I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've used solar power for uh, 25 years now, big fan. But it's not going to solve the problems. Europe is going to need natural gas for a long time to come. Suncor does a lot of hydrogen. We're a big hydrogen player, big producer, big consumer. We announced a big project for, the, uh, for Edmonton with Atco that will be a blue hydrogen um, plant. Um, believe me, there's a lot of hype about hydrogen. And right now, Europe wants hydrogen as part of, as part of the, the, the strategy, but the infrastructure isn't there. It isn't, it isn't something that can be used yet. Natural gas, and I don't think anybody's going to trust the Russians um, for a very long time. And uh, I, would, I would argue there are a number of other countries where there's going to be a much bigger bar in terms of trust. All of that speaks to Canada being an, an, a, a, a really important player. And, you know, um, I don't want to wade into the political world, but a certain prime minister told a certain chancellor that there was no business case for LNG in Canada um, right around the same time that Australia signed a 40-year deal with Germany. Well, one, you don't talk about, oh, sorry, there's not a business case to allies. That's just not, I think, the appropriate approach to helping people we want to help. Um, and two, hydro hydrogen is a long way from becoming um, something that's realistic. So I, I think the opportunity for LNG is, is huge. You're going to have another, you're going to have Mike Rose here is going to be able to speak obviously much more eloquently about natural gas and the opportunities than I, but as a Canadian it is frustrating. But I would not let anybody say, well, we sort of missed that boat. Mm. This is going to be a very important commodity for a long time to come. But I'm watching a few smiles and a few nods. So, uh, care for your thoughts on hydrogen? I, I think within one or two weeks, you're also going to hear the announcement of a big LNG deal between Germany and Qatar. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, where is Canada? <laughs> That's uh, my question. All right. Watch this space by the sounds of it. That's encouraging. Um, we are transitioning away from fuel intensive energy to material intensive energy. What is the role of mining? Martha, you want to take that one? 
I'm assuming that means things like batteries. I'm gonna guess. Yeah. For for electric vehicles, one, if I could just a little a little uh, my own personal rant. I really like it when people start using ZEV as as the terminology <laughs> because it's the emissions that count. It's we've tried to be technology agnostic. Um, uh, yes, this is going to be fascinating. Mm. Um, you know, talk about domination. I thought some of your commentary earlier about yeah. China and mm. the competition that they're competing for energy sources or or the products that we need to make sure we have energy sources is going to is could actually move the climate change effort um, more quickly than multilateral collaboration because that you know brave efforts but the results aren't there. Um, I found that very interesting but also really disturbing mm. because we know that there are a few countries, China being the most obvious example, um, making huge strides um, to lock up a lot of that supply and so it's a big issue. We in Canada have opportunities but we can't, we can't build on them if we don't get our act together and actually do stuff. It just takes so long to, to, to get policy and, and, and build things in this country. It's, um, uh, it, put it this way, we've missed a couple of opportunities. Let's not miss this one too. Bruno, I wanted to ask you about something that came up in our ESG panel this morning where they talked about from a corporate investment standpoint, one of the things that historically markets look for is stability. One of the things we feel like we're suspended in at the moment is, is chaos with sort of an outlook to rising geopolitical uncertainty. Is that a fair assessment of where you think that's going and, and what challenge do you think that political reality is going to pose for the capital that we need to see moving into you know, uh, new technologies, different sectors to support the energy transition and, and climate change and emissions targets? Well, that's exactly the problem the way I see it. So I'm not so much worried about heating homes in Germany or Central Europe this winter. I think we already have the storage up and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of LNG is arriving. The problem is over the medium long term, whether Europe is going to be able to create the predictable, stable environment for business to operate. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and if you're trying to invest in batteries in Europe, do we look at the energy costs and do you look at access to minerals, uh, critical minerals and raw materials? And do you start to wonder if the framework is in place? Maybe it isn't in place. Mm. So we have to be very concerned about creating that stable, secure framework. It's not enough to go to Qatar every year to negotiate uh, 1.5 billion in, in LNG, you know, you need a stable agreement with partner countries or regions in the world that can really transform the business environment. Right now, as I said in my initial comments, uh, it's very easy to be pessimistic about what could happen in Europe. Um, if the aluminium and steel industry disappears, then it's another level that we become dependent on other countries for the energy transition where Europe was supposed to be a leader. Mm. Uh, but that cannot happen under these circumstances for sure. To flip it, what makes you optimistic? I mean, it's this dynamic that, that, uh, that I talked about, that the more we enter an energy crisis, the more our ingenuity and mm. urgency and Comes sense of need uh, is present. Uh, mm. and, and so, you know, being pessimistic is also a way to be optimistic because I don't think the current situation is sustainable. Uh, it was no longer sustainable. We had a sort of a, an energy uh, illusion mm. and now it's crashing down and it was based you know on the idea that the United States would be able to provide uh, a global energy environment uh, it was founded on the idea that renewables were a miracle mm. and it was founded on the idea that um, Russia would become like us so you know all these illusions were went into building an artificial virtual world which is now crashing down and if we're aware of this, then we have to do something about it. So I want to close by asking both of you, sometimes when we can sit in conversations like this, geopolitics feels so big, it feels so beyond each and every one of us that it's hard to know what, what meaning to make, what to do after hearing a conversation like this. So I'd love for you to anchor it down to the individuals in this room. What is it that they can leave a conversation around geopolitics and do, whether it's being more alive to watching and paying attention to certain trends, whether it's engaging in uh, a different type of conversation 
I think making it practical and trying to think about how do you, how do you engage in this conversation that's moving with the dynamism that's moving and not be overwhelmed by it. Um, I would love each of you, maybe Bruno will go to you first. What, what's your closing uh, note, I guess, to our audience around what meaning to make of this conversation and what to do about it? I mean, take energy seriously. Uh, I think if you're in this conference, you probably already do. Um, but, uh, you know, there's still a lot of prejudices around energy, that it's not interesting, uh, and that it's, that it's uh, just about, you know, commodities. Uh, it's not intellectually attractive. Uh, get rid of that idea. Try to connect the dots. Uh, read many different things, from natural science to politics, and make an effort of trying to connect ideas from different, uh, different disciplines. I think that's always my advice. And, Energy, as uh, an author that I'm sure lots of people here like, uh, Václav Schmil, says energy is, is ideal for that purpose because you have to bring so many disciplines to bear on, uh, on, on energy, from natural science to economics to history to geopolitics, as we saw here. And I hope geopolitics is going to continue being central to the energy discussion because I hope to be coming back and going to many different energy conferences in the future. <laughs> we hope you'll be back at ours, that's for sure. Uh, Martha, what about you? Um, I think... I uh, wasn't actually prepared for that question, advice to the crowd, but I think uh, one of the things that I would say is do not let the rise of the concern over energy security diminish the appreciation of the importance of dealing with climate change. Mm. Okay, so as I said earlier, it has to be both. We have to address both mm. um, because I am worried. I, I, do, I do worry that there, that there'll be a bit of a shift. <clears throat> so I think... Um, we need to address both. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if you looked at it just from a purely economic perspective, Bruno's comments earlier about the, 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 the economic competition for control over energy is going to be, I'm, para I'm paraphrasing, so I'm, 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 I hope I'm not getting the evil eye, but that's what, what I was taking from, from your comments. Um, so, so we also in Canada have to remember we do have energy, we do have those opportunities mm -hmm. Let's not let others um, take advantage. Let's not be naive about that. Let's understand that um, both from a climate change energy transition perspective, but also from a country that currently has an awful lot of energy that will continue to be used for a long time, we will only be able to really capitalize on that if we're also seen to be doing it's, it, the, the full ESG. It's a little bit like mm. it's not just your shareholders, it's your voters. It's the citizens in your country from whom you have to get support to be able to do what you're doing. And, and there is a big expectation that we continue to, to, to really focus on the, on the broad range of ESG and, and emissions reduction. So I think that would be it. Don't, don't think that you know, this is changing that. Um, uh, I think Canada has an incredible opportunity to step up to both. So take energy seriously and join the dots, and yes, and to the idea of leaning yeah. into the energy security piece and be being no less ambitious about climate change aspirations. Can you join me in thanking Bruno and Martha for a fascinating and critical <laughs> conversation? Thank you both. Thank you.